Hello, and welcome to worship at University Christian Church. My name is Russ Peterman, and I am the senior minister here. And it is my deep joy and great privilege to welcome you to worship this morning. We are one church in many locations. And so wherever you are today, wherever you are emotionally, wherever you are spiritually, wherever you are physically, it is good for us to be together. And we thank you for the incredible privilege of being welcomed into your homes this morning. Whether we are with you around your dining table or in your living room, we thank you for the sacred privilege of allowing us to worship God together. In this time of social distancing, it's more important than ever to, to experience that sense of connection and belonging. And so it is so good for us to be together in this way. As we begin our time of worship together, I hope that you will take just a moment to create a sacred space, to try and clear out as many distractions that may be around you, to maybe light a candle if you have one, to signify the presence of God, to, to find your Bible, to grab some elements for communion. We'll be sharing the Lord's Supper in just a little bit. And then, and then I hope you'll take just a moment to go to our website if you're not there already. To go to our website at universitychristian.org and register your attendance with us. We want to know who you are, where you're joining us from. Also, you'll notice that on that same space, there is a place for you to share with us any prayer concerns that you may have. If there's a way that we can join you in prayer, either with you or for you, we hope that you will allow us that incredible privilege of surrounding you with our love and with our prayers. And also there will be a tab there for you to, to give online as, as we bring our gifts and our tithes and our offerings to God in this moment of worship. Church, it is so good for us to be together, to experience the holiness and the sacredness of God, to be connected to the Spirit of the loving God who created us unique, who loves us just as we are. So let us gather together. And let us worship as one. Please join me in a responsive call to worship this morning. Adults and youth, you will see your parts printed on the screen. Children, when you see a star, your part is, we are God's people. Let us praise God. Have you ever felt isolated and alone? Yes, at times we have felt lost. But we know that even in those times, we are God's people. As we worship, we give thanks to God. We are grateful for God's love and hospitality. We give thanks that no matter what happens, we are God's people. Let all of God's children proclaim, we, we are, are God's, God's people. people. As we begin our time of worship on this Memorial Day weekend, let's take a moment to remember those who gave their lives in service to our country. Let us pray. Eternal creator of all, we thank you for declaring our goodness when you spoke your world into being. Thank you for binding us together in your family, a bond that is stronger than any boundary or division that tries to separate us. God, lift up the hearts of those for whom this day is not a diversion, but a painful memory. Comfort all who grieve the loss of the ones we honor on this day and make us grateful for the freedoms we have, recognizing that there are many in our country and around the world for whom liberty is not a reality. So help us strive for justice and equality and peace for all of your children as we wait with hope for the day when peace shall reign 
and the blessed mourners will be comforted and when death and crying and pain will be no more. Amen. This morning, we wanted to take a few minutes to celebrate the members of our faith community who are graduating from college this year. We are so incredibly proud and impressed by all of your hard work. Some of you we've had the pleasure of knowing since you were toddlers at the Wite School, and others we've had the joy of sharing life with these past few years as you studied across the street at TCU. This morning, as we feature pictures and quotes from our graduates, the music that is playing under those is special as well. Jeff Tolis, who grew up here at UCC and has shared his gift of music with us for many years, wasn't able to perform his senior recital, his capstone project, as he graduated from SMU. And so this morning, he is able to share that with us. We thank you, Jeff, and we are excited to hear your hard work. Class of 2020, we are proud of you. We want you to continue listening to that divine voice within and let your life speak. We love you. Congratulations.
What a joy it is to be church together, to celebrate all of life's moments, big and small, the easy ones and the messy ones. Our ministers and prayer groups continue to cherish the opportunity to hold each of you in prayer. You are invited to share your joys and concerns with us via our website or by phone. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. God of guidance and grace, we thank you for the perseverance of our graduates and the completion of another academic year. Bless and guide them as they chart new beginnings and navigate the rapidly changing world ahead of them. Help them to use all that they have learned to make this world a better place, to serve others in true solidarity, to seek ways to help the poor and the marginalized and those who are suffering. May they always seek to bring about your peace and your justice. We pray for the spiritual eyes and discernment you give them in all things. Give them ears to hear you so that they may be wise leaders who transform this world with your love. Make their hearts and spirits open to every purpose and call that you have for them. Give them the courage to go willingly and boldly wherever you ask. We pray this all in your son's name, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We are in the middle of a series that we're calling Now What? Talking about what it means to live as resurrection people in a hurting world. We're in the season of Easter. Easter is more than just a day, and we're looking at what resurrection means. What, what is the meaning of Easter? Not what happened. But what does it mean here, today? Not after we die and we all go to heaven, but what does it mean in the way that we make decisions and relate to one another, the way that we live our lives? On Easter Sunday, it's easy to live as a resurrection person, isn't it? But as we move deeper into the Easter season, as we get farther away from that day, especially, especially in the midst of a global pandemic, it gets even harder becomes more challenging. Now, you would think, right, that in the moments of crisis that, that it would be easier for us to come together. But as we are being reminded in the midst of this crisis, it's also showing some of our differences as well. R right now, across the United States, we are wrestling with how to create and to cultivate a common life together. We're trying to balance our economic needs with our health needs. We're trying to balance our isolation and our general stir-craziness, if I may coin a term, with protecting, protecting the most vulnerable among us. The truth is, we don't always know the best, easiest way to do that. As a result of that, we are becoming, in many ways, deeply divided. You may remember just a few weeks ago when we first started this whole thing that we were all in this together. We can do this together, we said, but, but sadly, over the weeks, eh, this has become deeply politicized. And so now what? How do we live as a resurrection people in moments like this when we don't agree? This is what we're going to be looking at this morning. The text that we're about to hear comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Now, when you think of Corinthians, what is it that you immediately think of? Now, my guess is that you probably said 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. 
Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. But what we fail to remember is that Corinth in that day would have made Las Vegas look like a Sunday school picnic. It was a total mix of all kinds of people, all different types of religions. The type of place where anything goes religiously, socially, sexually. In fact, I think it was in Corinth where they developed the tagline, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It's not the type of place that your parents would want you to go on spring break. But Paul had planted this community of Jesus followers in this culturally savvy city where people worshipped all sorts of different things. And Paul has planted this church, and yet he's moved on to Ephesus. But as we'll hear, things are quickly falling apart. The people in Corinth are finding all sorts of ways to divide themselves. And there was a woman named Chloe who was a a community leader, a, a person of importance, and she sends word to Paul that things are quickly falling apart. And he sends this letter that begins this way. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you say, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with elegant wisdom, so that the cross of Christ may not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. argument in the church? Good Christian people disagreeing with one another? Thank God that doesn't happen anymore. (laughs) Then again, it doesn't happen any less either, does it, now that I think about it? I heard a story not too long ago about a, a man who lived in the Appalachian Mountains during the Great Depression. And he traveled at one point to do some business in the great city of Knoxville, Tennessee. And while he was there, he encountered a refrigerator that made ice. Now, this was uh, in summertime, and they were in the middle of this incredible heat wave, and he believed that this had to have been a miracle of God, that a machine could make ice, that, that people could have ice in their drinks in the middle of this incredibly hot time. When he returned to his hometown, he went to his church's midweek revival service. And there was a time in that service that people could give their testimony. And he stood up and he testified about the miracle that he witnessed. A machine that could make ice in the summer. Now, right there in that revival meeting, a dispute broke out, and uh, some people chimed in that there was no way that that there could be such a thing. And, And other people believed him and believed that this miracle machine could really make ice. Well, over the next several weeks, it escalated, and eventually, eventually, it resulted in a church split, with some people leaving the church and starting another church down the street. And in that community, in that city, they were known as the No-Ice Baptists and the Ice Baptists. It's amazing, isn't it, the things that we will find to argue about? 
it's so hard for us to agree on just about anything. And not just the major things either, but the, but the small things too. We are so challenged by this idea of, of getting along with one another, of being considerate with one another, of cultivating this common life that we share together. I'm always amused when I hear Christian people pine for the good old days of the early church. The time when, when, when the church was more peaceful, more pure, more unified. But the Bible, of course, tells us otherwise. And that's good news, too, because we have countless examples of how to achieve unity amidst diversity. In this church in Corinth, it was new, and it was still trying to find its way. And with this strange mix of values and norms, it was starting to wander off and incorporate other religious traditions as well. The church was constantly, apparently, getting in in disagreements. In fact, if you read through the entire book, the entire letter, Paul seems to be constantly pulling people apart, breaking up fights, settling disagreements and arguments. But here, in the beginning of the letter, Paul is trying to set the tone, appealing to them to to not let those disagreements divide them and tear them apart, that they should try to get along, that there should be no divisions among them, Paul says. Now, when I hear that, I have to ask, is that even possible? Some say no, because churches... Churches are made up of people, and people love to disagree. I had a friend in California who was a colleague, and she used to always ask the question, is it more important to be right or in relationship? Now, most of us would say from time to time that, well, if we're honest, more often than not, we'd rather be right even at the sake of the relationship. But do you know what the word religion means? It's a good word that means to bind together that which has been torn apart. To bind together that which has been torn apart. But instead, far too many, it has come to mean majoring in the minors, being unable to see the forest for the trees, winning the battle but losing the war, making a mountain out of a molehill. Everyone is capable of such nonsense, I believe, but it seems that religious people, we're just really good at it. Adam Hamilton wrote a book a number of years ago called Seeing Gray in a World of Black and White. And he said, he said, our desire for certainty, our need to be right, our tendency to miss the point have conspired to cause endless divisions in the Christian life. Our tendency to label others that we don't disagree with, to separate ourselves between us and them, to demonize anyone who disagrees with us, all of this leads to, to black and white, either-or thinking. Leads people to think that, that I'm right, you're wrong, that I'm faithful and you're unfaithful, that, that I'm whole and you are somehow wounded or broken, that we have it figured out, and you, not so much. Hamilton says that that sort of thinking is killing the church. I'll take it another step further. I think it's destroying our nation. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln looked out on a nation that was split in half. And he mused with Jesus' words and said, A house divided against itself cannot stand. The Civil War would come two years later. And our nation, in many ways, is still recovering from that. And today, we are divided again. More polarized, perhaps, than we've been since that Civil War. United we stand. 
But divided we fall. Now, let me be clear that when we talk about unity, that does not necessarily mean uniformity. To say we don't agree doesn't mean that I have to somehow convince you that I'm right and you're wrong or convince you that, that my point is better than yours, that I have to convert you to my way of thinking. That being said, there are some ways of looking at the world, some ways of looking at other people that are simply not correct. In fact, they are harmful. There are approaches to life that some take negatively, that they impact our life together and do harm to our brothers and sisters. And some of these behaviors are carried out by individuals, some by institutions, some even by religious communities. And those things are wrong. And they need to be called out and they need to be named. So now what? How do we do this? When we are so deeply divided, when we can't get along, when we see things so differently, how do we do this? Just like in the city of Corinth, we, we all have our competing affiliations. We pledge our lives to different things, things that, that define us, that lead us to value others in different ways. Look at the bumper stickers or the magnets that people place on their cars, the flags that they hang from their porches, the yard signs that they put in the ground. All of those things, all of those things are symbols of our affiliations. But what Paul is asking the members of the church in Corinth, what Paul is asking us, is to whom do you belong? To whom do you belong? You see, I think that to live as resurrection is to see that our old ways of defining one another, of valuing one another, all that's changed. That the old life has passed away, that, that, that now we have a new life, a new way of seeing the world. Paul is saying that that all of those other affiliations, they now take a back seat to our affiliation to God through Jesus. That we belong to God. That we all belong to God. That that is our singular affiliation. I came across a fascinating story last week about a hotel in Jerusalem that was leased by the government to house people recovering from COVID-19. There were about 200 patients from all different top walks of life, all recovering from the virus, some, some of them fresh out of the hospital. Now they were forced to live together in this hotel until they are no longer contagious. The patients themselves nicknamed this place Hotel Corona. And because they had already had the virus, unlike the outside world on this strict lockdown, they could give each other high fives. They could hug each other. They could hang out together. Do you remember what that was like? Now, remember that this is Jerusalem. This is the Middle East. So you have Israelis and Palestinians, you have Jews and Arabs, you have religious people and secular people, you have Jews and Christians and Muslims, you have groups that normally in that part of the world don't mix together. And they were getting along, they were having fun, they were eating together, sharing jokes, they were doing Zumba because they were documenting themselves on social media, it was like the whole world was tuning in to watch this real-life reality TV show. And the surprising part in this drama was the lack of drama. Yeah, there were some disagreements, there were some differences, but over time, relatively quickly, they all became friends. One of the women interviewed for the story said that they had found something unique in that hotel. 
that they were all in this together. That they had more in common than those things that divided them and made them different. That, that they came to realize that, that the well-being of one was closely tied to the well-being of another. That what benefited one benefited all. I once heard a reality show producer interviewed and he confessed how hard it is to get people to fight, to disagree, and to argue just enough to keep the reality show entertaining. That you have to get the right cast of characters, that you have to, to stoke the conflict because, he said, people as individuals are frustratingly good at getting along. You see, if we belong to God and realize that everyone else does too, that all of our secondary alliances and allegiances just slip away. That's what Paul wanted the people in Corinth to know and to understand. And so maybe it begins with us getting past our own stubborn purpose, our commitment to our own views, to worry less about being right and more about being in relationship. To trust less in our opinion and more in our faith. To whom do you belong? Each week when we worship, we take a little time to reflect on the opportunity we have as followers of Jesus to show our gratitude to God by giving of our financial resources. Often we talk about the need of the giver to give, and today I wanted to share a beautiful example of that with you. I saw a Facebook post by Reverend Allison Lanza this week. Allison leads a group called Connect Fort Worth, which hosts justice and mission trips and teaches people how to put their faith into action. A little girl named Everly, whose grandparents are members here at University Christian Church, overheard her mother talking to Allison about the needs of some local families and how they needed something to eat. And so she decided to do something about it. Listen to this. So not that long ago, um, Everly's mom, Kara, and I were on the phone talking when the amazing Everly came in and said, Mom, I have a letter for you to mail to Allison. And it was already sealed, so we didn't know what was in it. So Kara addressed Everly's letter and put it in the mail. And then yesterday, I opened up my mail, and there was this letter from Everly. And it was a $100 bill. I was shocked. And so I thought it must have been a mistake. So I called Everly's mom to laugh about it, to figure out how I could return the $100 to her. But then a few minutes later, Everly called on FaceTime and she told me what she had sent the money for. She said she'd been learning about wants and needs at school. And she had been wanting something very much, a Barbie dream house, but she realized there were people who were hungry right now who had a need and that that need might be more important than her wants. So she'd sent me the hundred dollars to help share with people who are hungry that we know through Connect Fort Worth so they could have food right now. And what made you think about that? Oh, um, well, I knew um, people needed money to buy food and uh, I send it to Alan, Allison to spend for people for food. But it was in my give jar, so that's why I gave it to Allison. Now, tell me about your give jar. So my give jar is where I put money in, where I need it, where I want those monies to be given to people, someone else, and. That's why I gave it to Allison. Well, thank you, Everly, for your example and for uh, opening your heart and sharing that money with Allison so she can help others. I felt happy for the people who needed it and got the money to buy food. Wonderful.
Well, um, Everly, I was wondering if you would say a prayer for us uh, to give thanks to God for when people uh, give money to the church that uh, goes to help other people. Okay. Um, dear God, thank you for the things you made for us and the, and the love you put in us. Amen. Amen. Our gifts not only make a difference in others' lives, but it touches that place deep in our hearts that yearns to share with others. So I hope you will call the church or visit our website at universitychristian.org to find out how you can make a difference by contributing to the ministry and mission of University Christian Church. May God bless the gifts and the givers. Sharing meals and gathering around tables is in the rhythm of how we live together as friends, as family, at work, at school, and as church. And yet, what that looks like has changed drastically over the past couple of months. But the good news, the good news is that our host hasn't changed. Jesus, once again, invites us to share this meal together. This morning, we gather as church at different locations around different tables with different beliefs and ideas and even different communion elements. But we gather as Christ's church at God's table, connected by the spirit that makes us one. And so I invite you at this time to gather your communion elements, whatever they may be. And if you know the words, say them with me. This morning, we remember and we celebrate and we give thanks that Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for all. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Shall we pray? God of grace, lover of our soul, God of our weary years, we've come this far by faith. Great is thy faithfulness. You called us to be one people for such a time as this and this space. Thank you, God, for this communion table, the bread, the cup, God of our weakness and brokenness. Forgive us when we're short-sightedness. Remind us that your mercies are new each morning. In your strength, we are made strong. As we are nurtured by this bread, may we Drink deeply of this cup and remember your love, your healing power for the whole world. It is in the name, the tender name of the Messiah, the resurrected one, the Christ of the cross, we pray. Amen. Let us take the bread. and let us drink from the cup.
As a community of faith, we have worshiped together today. We have praised God. We have prayed. We have gathered around Christ's table. And now I invite the youngest children of God among us to gather for children's worship, to gather with your families. The information for our children's worship and where you can find that is on the screen now. But gather as we share and are led by children, as we read scripture, as we have a children's moment, and as we figure out ways that we can put our faith into action this week, as we are all on the path to figuring out how to share Christ's courageous love in our world so that we can all be transformed. So children, gather with your families and experience children's worship this week. Again, I want to thank you for joining us this morning for worship. And we hope and pray that this service has been both meaningful and memorable to you. And that at some point during the service, you have felt and sensed the presence of God that is as near to you as your next breath. If you are new to UCC and want to find out more about what it means to be a part of this congregation, about who we are and who we're working to be, I invite you to visit our website at universitychristian.org. There you will find all sorts of information. And I want to let you know that next Sunday we will be celebrating the day of Pentecost, what is oftentimes known as the birthday of the church. Our senior associate minister, Reverend Shannon Moore, will be preaching and he will be wrapping up this series on Now What? And since the color for Pentecost is red, we are inviting all of you to submit a picture this week of you dressed in red. We'll be interspersing those in the middle of the service for you to participate in that service as well. And now, church, let us go out into the world, even if we're staying home, and trust, trust that God goes with us that God is with us, holding us in the very palm of God's hand and sustaining us in the midst of these unsettling times. And as we go, may God bless us and keep us. May God's face continue to shine upon us and give us hope now and forevermore. Amen.